Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. There are things we don't talk about. You know, this is true on a smaller scale. I bet there's stuff you don't talk about with, say, your family. And it's true on a larger societal scale. You know, there are just things most people avoid talking about in detail because it makes us feel bad in some way. Today, we've got two books that deal with these topics that mostly go untalked about. In a bit, we'll hear from author Alice McDermott, whose latest novel talks openly about miscarriages. But first, Vanessa Chan's book, The Storm We Made, takes place in Malay, underneath Japanese colonial rule during World War II. And Chan tells NPR's Rob Schmitz that it's an aspect of the war that rarely makes it into the history books, in part because of how reticent the survivors of the occupation are to talk about everything they went through. That's in a minute. This message comes from Apple Card. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can earn 4.35% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account. A high yield, low effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. In her new book, The Storm We Made, author Vanessa Chan weaves the complicated and intriguing tale of a family navigating colonial Malaya, now known as Malaysia. A mother trying to find meaning becomes a spy for Japanese occupiers. Her eldest daughter tries to keep her youngest out of the so-called comfort homes, and a son who disappears suddenly into the Japanese labor camps. The horror of wars may be a main character in the book, but it's also the story of what people do to try and survive these horrors. Vanessa Chan joins us now. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, Rob. So Cecily Alcantara and her family are front and center in this book. Introduce us to them. Yes, yeah, Cecily is a you know a bored, dissatisfied housewife in 1930s British Malaya, which is what Malaysia used to be called. And um, she, you know, in her quest for fulfillment or just to find a bigger life, uh, becomes seduced by you know a man and an ideology and becomes a spy who ushers in the worst, most violent occupation her country has ever seen during the Second World War. And her children, who are aged between 7 and 17, are living with the consequences of their mother's actions during the Second World War, but they don't know her devastating secret. And you tell this story from four points of views, one from each member of the Alcantara family. Why did you choose to go this route? I think it was important to me to be able to showcase each character in their setting very accurately. Uh, Otherwise, it would be, you know, I think more challenging because they're all in different places, both mentally and physically at the time in the book. Also, uh, Rob, I, I think that's the way I process information. This book was always in multiple points of view because I come from a very large extended family and everyone in my family always talks at the same time. So I like to process information as it comes in multiple threads figure out what's happening, and then, you know, bring it all together. And I think that's how storytelling ended up working for me. And it's a great way to tell a story. I mean, when we talk about World War II, we often focus on Nazi Germany and the European theater, or in the Asian theater, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But Southeast Asia is often left out of history books. What don't most people know about that part of the war that you wanted to tell? Everything. I think the Pacific theater is, you know, widely unwritten by historians, uh, by fiction writers, nonfiction writers. And that's, you know, for a number of reasons, you know, one being perhaps the more Eurocentric view of the world that uh, historians tend to have, but also just because people in Asia and Southeast Asia who survived those times are quite reluctant to talk about their experiences. And so it was important to me to lay down some of these stories that I'd heard on paper because stories, you know, they're just, they're just stories until you write them down. That's the only time they become history. And so I decided it was time for this history to exist. And I wrote down the stories that I heard. Tell me about the stories, because I'm I'm curious, you know, you talked about your big family. I know that uh, your grandmother was an inspiration for this book. Uh, Tell us about her and, and what her experience was during that time. My grandmother was, I think, aged between sort of 12 and 15 during the uh, years of the Second World War and the Japanese occupation. So a very formative time during her life. And 
you know, she lived through a lot. She would tell me these stories uh, while I was growing up, uh, both, you know, stories of struggle, how they used to have to mix in tapioca and sometimes even paper uh, into their rice rations to survive about a time where, you know, she was cycling home one day and uh, she felt the earth shake and she just kept going. But it turned out there was an enormous uh, bomb from an airstrike, an unscheduled airstrike that dropped just behind her. So she just made it home. But there were also stories of the hope and joy that people find a way to find during these times. She told us about how she and her siblings cut a hole in the fence so that they could sneak over to the neighbor's house during uh, after curfew. Hmm. So they could take tango lessons. And my grandma, as it turns out, is a very good dancer. And she credits her dancing shoes to the, that, those lessons she had during the war. <laughs> and I wanted to ask about one of your characters who is sort of a side character, but in some ways is an incredibly important character, Fujiwara, who recruits Cecily as a spy. He's sort of this kind of chameleon-like character becoming who people want him to be. What was the inspiration for this character? So in reality, he is based on a person in history, which people call the Taiga of Malaya, Mm -hmm. a general called Tomoyuki Yamashita, who uh, led the invasion of Malaya and uh, Singapore during the time. You know, he was a known figure in history. But as with a lot of historical figures, there are gaps. We don't know, uh, you know, whether he was a a reluctant soldier or, you know, a strong believer. And so I chose to color between the lines and and uh, write about this charismatic general who believes in, you know, in Asia for Asians and, and a whole new world. And he's very idealistic, but also quite resourceful and recruits Cecily to try and build this new world together. You know, one theme that comes up often in this book is Cecily's idea that inside of all of us, there's a duality of of both good and bad. And we see this play out in many of the characters uh, that you portray. Why did you want to dig into that? I think I believe in that duality. I am drawn to characters, uh, both in fiction and in life, who are not necessarily good and bad. I think that morality is a function of one's circumstances and you never really truly know what you are going to do, how you're going to act and what sort of principles you have or when your principles evolve, when you are, you know, faced with uh, the need to survive. And so it was important to me to show that even when someone has the best intentions or intends to be heroic, faced with dire circumstances. They may make different choices than we would want them to make. You worked for Facebook for six years in public relations. What inspired you to leave that job and to start writing? Gosh, so many things. I think the biggest of all is I am a citizen of Malaysia. And when I moved to the U.S. for college and then started work, I always needed a work visa. And it took me many, many years to be able to get residency in the U.S. and uh, not be tied to an employer. And when I finally got that residency and realized that I could pursue whatever it was I wanted, which was a freedom I had never been able to conceive in my life, it took me another three years to figure out what to do with that freedom. And I finally decided to uh, give writing a shot. I'd always loved to write. I used to write bad poetry to my parents on their birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally decided to apply to uh, Masters of Fine Arts programs. And I moved to New York City just to give the writing thing a shot for two years. It's been four years, so uh-huh. I think we're doing all right. <laughs> yeah, I think you're doing okay. That's Vanessa Chan. Her new book is The Storm We Made. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. This message comes from NPR sponsor BetterHelp. Around New Year's, people can obsess with changing and forget what they're already doing right. Therapy can help you recognize your victories and continue them this new year. Try New Year, same you with BetterHelp's online therapy. Visit BetterHelp.com slash NPR today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash NPR. Support for NPR and the following message come from Betterment, an automated investing and savings app. 
CEO Sarah Levy shares why accessibility is central to Betterment's mission. The real innovation for Betterment was taking a set of tools that were used by the ultra wealthy and making them accessible to the average investor. And that includes tax strategies, that includes dollar cost averaging. These are all sort of tricks of the trade. Learn more about automated investing technology at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk. Performance is not guaranteed. This message comes from NPR sponsor Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, inflation is everywhere. So Mint Mobile is offering premium wireless starting at just $15 a month. To get your new phone plan for just $15, go to mintmobile.com slash switch. There's a great significance in the ongoing drama of free production. That's a line that author Alice McDermott says to NPR's Juana Summers in this next interview. It's about her book, Absolution, which takes place in Saigon, 1963. And in it, the two central characters share this really tender and emotionally charged moment following a miscarriage. And McDermott is making the point that that stuff, the stuff that can really only be shared at this time between two women, is just as important as the wider geopolitical events of the day. The question at the heart of Alice McDermott's latest book is, what do you sacrifice in order to do something good for someone else? The author's answer is told through the story of Trisha, a young wife who's moved to 1963 Saigon with her new husband, an engineer loaned to the Navy. She is a stranger in a strange land in many ways. A working class girl, first to go to college in her family, an all-girl Catholic school in Manhattan. And she's following her up-and-coming, rising into the upper classes husband to Saigon. She's not quite sure why there are so many American engineers in Saigon in 1963. But she sees herself, as many women of that era did, as a helpmeet to her husband. Almost immediately, Trisha is swept up into the world of another Saigon wife, Charlene. She sort of burst into the novel in much the same way she burst into Trisha's life. My first reaction was very much like Trisha's, like, oh, God, I know this type. You know, the pushy corporate wife getting you to do things you don't want to do and smarter than everybody else. But she also is very philosophical about her role in the world. She disapproves of human suffering. The story of the relationship between the two women is recounted through letters decades later between Trisha and Charlene's daughter, Rainey. I think what that distance does is, number one, it gives Trisha an opportunity to tell her story because a woman of that era would say, my husband was doing the important things. But also Rainey, who's a child in 1963, Ask Trisha, do you remember me? Do you remember my mother? And that gives Trisha permission to remember. And as Trisha remembers that relationship with her polar opposite Charlene, what the two women gave each other all those years ago in Saigon and what they learned about life becomes clear. Female relationships are where you can have some of the most interesting conversations because nobody's stopping to mansplain that you don't have the politics right or the history (laughs) right. And again, when you're dealing with women of this era, basic things they didn't know about their bodies, basic things they didn't know about childbirth and miscarriage. Uh, Miscarriage was not spoken of. Yes, it was a failing, but in some ways, because it wasn't spoken of, it made it seem even worse. But women could speak to one another about that. So in some ways, Charlene is a guide for Tricia through this world, but she's also an opportunity for Trisha to discover what she thinks and how she feels. She pushes Trisha into some uncomfortable places, but also enlarges her sense of what she can do in the world. What do you think it is that Trisha pushes Charlene to do or challenges Charlene? What do you think her role is? You talked about how Charlene pushes her into uncomfortable places, but what about Trisha's end of the bargain? Yeah, At one point, Trisha describes how she gives a phrase that Trisha has learned, the Hebrew midrash of Tikkum Olam, repair the world. And she gives it to Charlene because she sees this as kind of what Charlene, in her limited circumstances, wants to do. Charlene turns right back and says, ah, yeah, but the Buddhists say, mend yourself. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that's the heart of the question 
that Charlene proposes to Tricia. Do you go out and battle against this human suffering that is insurmountable? Or do you lock the door and say, I'm just going to take care of what I'm meant to take care of? Tricia is very eager to grow her family and to have a child, but she does have these multiple miscarriages. And there is this beautiful but incredibly devastating scene in your book after Trisha has a miscarriage after about three months of pregnancy and Charlene comes to visit her. And there's this moment that I will not forget where the two of them are looking at that embryo together and Charlene baptizes it. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about that scene and that moment? In some ways, I think this is the moment where Charlene, the stereotype, (laughs) the annoying charity lady, becomes fully human. Charlene comes in and offers her comfort and gives a sense of respect to the grief that she's living through when the wider world, the male world, would not have done so. Trisha's husband, as good-intentioned as he is, doesn't really know what to say to her, except maybe get over it, (laughs) you know. But Charlene gives the grace of allowing her to mourn and recognizing the importance of this. And I think also it's that sense, and and, and in many ways I think this is what the novel ultimately became for me, the value we place on any life, children's lives, especially, especially in war, something we're all very aware of right now. What value do we place on motherhood, childhood, the grief that we feel in any ordinary life. I think perhaps one of the reasons that this scene has stuck with me and I found it so moving is because even today where we talk about so many shared experiences, where we have more education and more knowledge about our own bodies as women, right. we do not talk or write about experiences of miscarriage and the level of detail and specificity that are shown in this book. What is it that you hope the reader takes away from this? Well, you know, one of the intentions, I think, of the novel and why I said it in 1963 in Saigon, because all these amazing world events were happening, but the lives of women also had great significance to them and their ongoing. And so the female friendship, the works of charity, bringing lollipops to the children in the hospital. In some ways, when you put that work up against all the world-changing things that were happening, it seems trivial. And I guess I wanted to shine the light on that and say, no, it is not. It is as human and as complicated as what the CIA was doing, (laughs) the men in the CIA were doing in Saigon in 1963, as all the world events that 1963 is so rich in. There's great significance in the ongoing human drama of reproduction. One of Charlene's refrains about suffering is, don't turn away from it. Even if you can't solve it, it is a small evil to turn away from it. And in some ways, the complexity of women's lives, the complexity of having children, bringing them into the world, raising them safely, giving them a chance to have their own children, is something that we should respect and not turn away from as well. One of the things you mentioned earlier is that one of the central questions of this book is, what is the value and the meaning of charity. And I wonder if you think that the book offers an answer to that, or is there an easy answer to that question? Yeah, I hope there's not an easy answer. I thought I, um, It's complicated. And I think the easy answers in some ways make shallow every effort. You know, why you're doing that, that's not going to do any good. Or do that, it's going to do good. No, it's not. Something terrible will still happen elsewhere in the world. The professor at the University of Virginia who gives Tricia the phrase, Tikum Olam, repair the world, compares it to the old house he lives in. You fix one thing, for sure something else is going to be broken. That's the nature of what we live with. So it's complicated. And there is that sense of what do you sacrifice in order to do something for someone else? Alice McDermott, thank you so much. Thank you. Her new novel, Absolution, is out now. 
That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookoftheday at npr.org. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Isabella Gomez Sarmiento and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Melissa Gray, Danny Hensel, Todd Munt, Emiko Tamagawa, Andrew Craig, Hadil El Shalchi, Samantha Balaban, Courtney Dorning, and Elena Burnett. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. On the TED Radio Hour, data scientist Hannah Ritchie has a controversial message for young people who think climate change has doomed their generation. I wanted to turn that on its head and say, we can stop this, we can challenge this, and we could be the first generation to achieve sustainability. Ideas to get you through 2024. That's on the TED Radio Hour from NPR. The following message comes from NPR sponsor, Mass Mutual. Wayfinders is a nonprofit that partners with the Mass Mutual Foundation to increase financial resilience. CEO Keith Ferry explains why building social capital is just as critical as financial capital. Everyone's got a network, but sometimes those networks are very limited. It's about expanding those opportunities, expanding those interconnections in the community so that people can see beyond where they are to the goals that they're trying to, to achieve. Visit MassMutual.com slash foundation to learn more. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the NPR Wine Club, with wines inspired by NPR, like Weekend Edition Cabernet and Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me Zinfandel, available to adults 21 or older. More at nprwineclub.org slash podcast.